Hey, hi guys, it's Paul Gold, co-creator of Tennis Doubles Mastery, on the phone with another co-creator of Tennis Doubles Mastery, Pete Tramacki. Pete, you okay? Paul, great to see you, mate. Well, great to talk to you. Pete was um, just, just, you know, bragging a bit, really, that he said that, ah, oh, did, did, did people know that he had beaten the Bryan Brothers twice in a row? Is that right? That's it, yeah. Competitively, not not just messing around in the back in the backyard, you know this is in competitive matches, uh, and then obviously they won. There was another match and they'd won. But um, we thought we'd get on the phone, and that was the cue for us to start talking about some doubles. Uh, but to lead off with what Pete remembers about those matches, beating the Bryan brothers, what was maybe the uh, the crux and uh, and what was making the difference back then, uh, and we'd kind of kind of lead off from there. So, Pete, when when was it, and what do, what do you remember from it? Yeah, well, look, Paul, uh, two thousand, the year two thousand, it was, and uh, I was playing a challenger event over in Armonk, which is near uh, New York. I was playing with Australia's Paul Kilderry, who now is the uh, manager of uh, Sam Stoza. And, uh, you know, look, we, we knew these Brian brothers uh, for a little bit of time. We'd seen them around the Challenger circuit for a little bit. Um, my ranking had dropped. So I was 45 in the world at one stage, and it dropped back to about 70, 80. And uh, Paul's ranking was about 130. So we sort of got together to try and boost his ranking up and, and get, get us into the Grand Slams, being back into the French and Wimbledon and the likes. Mm-hmm. And... Um, yeah, look, uh, so we knew these guys, uh, and we knew they were good. Uh, just a great team spirit, and uh, really animated, really fired up. And look, at, in the challenger level, some people looked at it as they were a little bit cocky, um, mm-hmm. being American also. You know, they they have that tradition of being a bit more in your face and so on. But deep down, you could really see their talent and their ability to uh, to work as a team and, and support each other through, you know, one person's strength covers another person's weakness and so on. And, uh, yeah, Paul and I were lucky enough to beat the guys uh, there in three sets. Uh, they, they were beating us, and we were actually down um, in the uh, second set, but turned that around and then uh, beat them again. I beat them actually another time with the, uh, Robbie Koenig, who's now one of the... Uh, TV commentators for uh, the world feed for all the all the Masters series and the the big tournaments and uh, we beat them at the Australian Open here uh, so that probably gave me a little bit more insight into them uh, tactically how to play them and uh, to then carry on to that second time that we played them there with uh, with Paul so uh, they look uh, certainly destined to be very good players but gee wouldn't have thought they could have gone as good as they have, but a, a real credit to them and their uh, and their family. Great parents, uh, good workers, and uh, great kids all around. Mm, mm. So, um, I mean, would you say was there anything that was it was it you? Just say going back to that first match, you said you were um, set down and, and probably and then down in the second. Is that right? But turned yeah, it around. Yep, yep. I mean, what, was it something you guys did? Or they stopped doing, or was it just a little bit more experience, or, or, or can you can you put your finger on that or not? Yeah, look, uh, Paul, just again to clarify, I think I think I have to check the the data book. Yeah, of no, course. I think I think we beat them. Uh, I think Robbie Koenig and I beat them at the Australian Open. That was our first. Ah, uh, right, okay. That was the first time. I think. Yeah, I, I sort of got that a little bit mixed up. It's it is ten or eleven years ago, but uh, mm. I think we beat them there, and that gave me that little bit more insight into them. As I said, to uh, now partnering Paul Kildare. Um Look, that match, it was a final. Paul and I had won uh, nine matches in a row already going into that final. Uh, we won the tournament before it. We knew after this tournament we were heading off to Paris to uh, to the French Open. And I think we just, we believed we could beat them. They were on fire and we just thought, look, just hang in there a little bit more. Just let them cool off. Uh, A little bit like, you know, they're talking a lot now with a lot of the top players. They go through, you know, a 20-minute, 30-minute time frame where they are playing just invincible tennis. And we just believed we could just hang in there long enough and, and sort of withstand the barrage and the storm that was in our face. 
And once you got that little opportunity, you had to take advantage of it. And uh, and that's something we did do. We were fortunate enough just to, they slipped up a little bit. We might have got one lucky return, so to speak. And then uh, all of a sudden we've got the one break point opportunity and bang, we took it. And uh, from there on, it, it sort of bust their bubble a little. And mm. uh, we were able to continue on and, and then try and run with our own momentum and uh, and come through with a victory. Actually, that's a quite a good point because I've I mean I've literally just come off court with uh, with a bunch of players and um, I commended one of the players who um, lost actually they were, we were doing some match play and they lost although they ended up winning the last very much a lot of the last few games mm-hmm. but what I, what I'd said to them was um, what I thought was great was. The, they were playing, we were doing some double stuff, and they were playing a pair that was a little bit better than them, but they just kept going. They kept going, and I said what I really liked was that they kept their level, even though they were losing, they kept their level, level steady, pretty, pretty steady all the way through. The other pair were playing well. They were a little bit better, but as soon as their level dropped, the other pair were there. They hadn't, they hadn't dropped their heads. They were there to, to capitalise on the drop in level of the slightly better pair and i think that's something that i i don't you must have to throw in for everybody that it's not um how great you play sometimes it's about keeping a high level maybe not your very very top level but keeping a high level consistently that's the real trick over the course of a match like you say where there are periods where people are just playing so well they're ebbing and flowing but the pair that kind of keeps their level up at the seven and eights consistently beats the pair that actually does have those tens but also has those twos that's right yeah look you hit the nail on the head there it is the consistency um looking in playing the sport itself in doubles it's more about percentages than it is about pace, for my liking. Mm. You know, it's mm. not about hitting bomb first serves, going after it and hitting your biggest and your best, because that's playing singles on the doubles mm. court. That's that's playing as an individual, uh, and if that if you miss, then your second serve is under a lot more pressure because mm. you've got that net player trying to impose themselves on a on a reasonably good return that goes down at your feet. So pressure builds, and like singles, doubles has that. Uh, real strong impact where the pressure builds the more balls you get in the court and and that's the way again like you say it's uh, playing at a at the same level at a seven at an eight the whole time as opposed to playing a nine and a ten down and dropping to a three four and the mm. likes because uh, that's when you know a, a run of momentum you can lose two or three games in a row and that that can throw you back quickly you know it look it's a bit like this two all three all playing at sevens and, and guys playing at eights and nines, well, they can't go much better, the eights and nines. So they're going to drop. All of a sudden, the guy that's playing at a seven takes the next three games. He's won the, won, or they've won the set 6-3. Mm. True, very true. So let's break off. And, and I mean, we've spoken a little bit about them, and, and I, don't want to, I don't want to spend the whole um, call talking about them. Um, but... I thought we'd link it in to maybe some of the other pairs that people may know, some of the other great pairs that we've seen, doubles pairs, and linking in um, what we've seen the Bryans do. And, and like we say, fair play to them. They've, they've you know, gone to the, the, the top rankings as, as a pair. Um, but are there any qualities that they have that we also see in some of the other pairs. And we were just talking briefly about some of the great pairs in, in what we've seen in doubles history, maybe all the way back to, I mean, they're not the earliest pairs, but certainly I think the superstar pair early on, I think were, correct me if I'm wrong, were possibly McEnroe and Fleming, only because of that era being the kind of Hollywood era almost, where it really became global, People were watching it on TV, you know, all the pictures of Borg winning his, you know, his five Wimbledon titles suddenly were, were beamed all across the world. So that era of tennis was, was possibly the golden age. So from there on, where McEnroe and Fleming were, were probably the first pair where people actually went, oh, they're a, 
you know, they're winning a lot of Wimbledon titles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, onwards, um, is there anything that we could maybe identify that those pairs had that, that kind of put them above some of the others, and then how we could maybe identify some of that stuff for for the guys listening, guys and girls listening, to say, right, see if you can take some of this magic dust and bring it into your game. Yeah, Paul, I think that's a that's a great question. Look at McEnroe Fleming. The the key to them, I think, was their chemistry. Uh, McEnroe was obviously a great singles player, but he mm. came to the court as a doubles player. Uh, Fleming was not the greatest of singles players. He he, he did well. He had some good results, but his ultimate, uh, the, or the, the his biggest asset was the way he was able to play doubles. Now it comes to to a communication, right? They were able to communicate. He was on a level path with what John McEnroe was, if if anyone ever could be, in his uh, fiery moments and so on. But uh, you know, and and when Mac got a bit upset, uh, Fleming was able to calm him down. Fleming was able to stay with him and get him. Hey, come on, look, let's let's focus on this and let's take our attention away from that and let's uh, let's look at trying to do this and do that and you know just change it up a little bit where he was able to. Uh, you know, basically, well, that's what it was, working as a team. And uh, that's what you've got to do that whole way through. Now, um, interesting there too, a left-hander and a right-hander. Mm. And I think that adds value to any team, no matter who you are. If we look through the history thereafter, well, look even before that, a Newcomb and a Roach, fantastic yeah. combination there as well. Lefty mm. and a righty. Uh, Newcomb played with uh, Owen Davidson, another lefty. Uh, Rod Laver did not too bad for himself either. He's lefty, mm. played with a couple of righties. Um, Woodbridge and Woodford, perfect example again, and, and they mm. were thereafter the history creators, uh, and now the uh, the Bryan brothers have, have topped their uh, records and so on. But um, you've also had in there an, another team, an American team, and a brother's team, uh, Luke and Murphy Jensen, who... Uh, yeah, Got to the top yeah. five and top ten of doubles, they won the French Open, but a lefty and a righty. And again, I think the the most important thing with uh, with the Bryan brothers and the and the Jensen brothers is that's what it is. They're brothers. They are on the same same wavelength, uh, ninety nine times out of a hundred. Mm. Well, here's a, here's an interesting fact for you, and uh, this is this is slightly away from the subject, but it's it's bang on the subject now. I'm a bit a bit freaky like this, but I was looking um, at some research, and um, they were looking at this whole thing. Really, what you're, what you're talking about? People actually working together, working on communicating together. And I wrote before about me and my kind of golden doubles period, if you want to call it that, where I hooked up with this guy, and we we used to we you know we used to. We never used to drive to tournaments separately. You know, we've started to play all around and traveling the country and, and stuff like that. And we would always drive in one car. Either he'd pick me up and drive or I'd pick him up and drive. And we would talk about what we were going to do and what we wanted to try and what we, were, what we had been practicing, you know, the week before, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even to the point where we'd stop pre-tournament and kind of we had this notebook that we used to kind of scribble on and just kind of draw little sketches of courts and talk about you know draw little plays on them and um people may laugh at that but here's the here's the interesting fact there was some research done where they had um two groups of people and they got them all to come in they all met and they had a day somewhere uh and then they sent one group away with with whatever task it's irrelevant really, and they kept another they got another the other half of the group to stay in contact and meet regularly, and they were meet, meeting several times a week or something. Um, they didn't know why, but they just said, "Look, we want you to meet up and socialise and go to the pictures or whatever, go watch a film and go to the pub and all this stuff." Um, and then about a month or so later, maybe a couple of months, can't remember. They got both, they got the whole group back in again, so kind of the two halves again, and they ran some tests. And what they were doing, they were asking, they were asking people on an individual basis a series of questions. 
and you can probably guess what was going to happen. The group that had actually met on a regular basis all came up when asked these random questions with very similar answers, almost like they were able to read the minds of all the other people in their same group. And the group that had, had split up after the first day and just done their own thing, all their answers were very, very random. Mm, yeah. No, I, I, I could see that for sure. Um, going back to your, you, you and your partner stopping and writing down stuff in your, mm. uh, in your books and things like that, mm. it's often talked about that people should have their, you know, their black book their little mm -hmm. black book, but their little black book of tennis and uh, of, of opponents, uh, singles tactically, doubles tactically, uh, as an individual, uh, as the Bryan brothers have pointed out, you know, they work on one player, they pick the player's weakness and they just target it. That way, Bob knows what Mike's doing. When the ball goes across to Bob, uh, to Mike, Bob knows where he's generally going to be hitting it, where then he can start to move and look to get involved and vice versa. Same when Bob's got his opportunity to play the shot, Mike's looking to get involved. And, you know, that's a, it's the greatest way to break down a good team is just pick out their one player or their, their slightest weakness and just keep mm. targeting and targeting. And then that, uh, that expose them. Um, it, it can break them down, break their momentum. And like I say, the, their team now, the other player tries too hard then because they want to try and do a little bit more and uh, then they try too hard, start making mistakes. Then all of a sudden, two players are nearly broken down. Therefore, that partnership's broken down, and you can sort of go on with the victory by just sticking with the guns. Mm. So, I mean, you, we, we, you talked about, and quite correctly, that some of the great pairs, you know, there were some great left-right-hand combinations. Now, if you're lucky enough to have that, that's great. If you haven't, that doesn't mean you can't play some some great doubles but i mean how important do you think it is that you really should have a big difference between the two of you when i say a, a difference you know you don't you don't want the same kind of um emotional characteristics you don't want the same kind of game you know you want you want differences look the philosophy uh, for me paul is if if you're a good server and volleyer you need to find a good returner uh, mm. as opposed to playing with another good servant volleyer. Because if you both can't return, as and, I mean, we can all return, but you know, if you're not returning the big points, if you can't return the big points, then you're not going to break serve. So already you've now created more pressure on your strength being your servant volley because the mm. others may have a good returner and that just breaks you down. Uh, same as if you've got two good returners, it's very hard then to uh, to win your serve. So a lot of pressure then on your returns. You start to go for more. You start to make mistakes. So you basically got to try to find that combination that complements your strength and your weakness. If I'm a good serve and volleyer, I will try and find a player who has a very good return and is very good on the on the ground strokes. Um, interesting for the Bryan brothers. Normally the left hander should play on the uh, second court. That's tradition. They've gone mm -hmm. away with that, and they put uh, they put the left hander on first court most times. Now they also have tactically messed with some of the top players in the world and switched on a uh, they played a tournament through with the lefty playing first court, righty playing uh, second court, mm -hmm. got to the final, and then switched sides because they knew their opponents know them so well that. That, 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 that now they all of a sudden their opponents have a new have to come up with a totally new strategy. I mean that's pretty good. That's a lot of confidence in doing that. But they backed themselves for it and uh, they went on and won the tournament. So and that would obviously but, be something that you you know they probably would <clears throat> you would want to practice as well. You know. So of you course, of course, you got to rehearse those sorts of things. But um, you know, uh, in in the I guess the the topic we're on here is, you know, how they can work together as a team, how mm. things complement each other. And like you say, with that little black book of tennis, knowing what your opponents uh, can and can't do and, and really trying to trying to break that down. Mm. But that little black book thing, um, it doesn't just for all the people thinking, yeah, but I don't know, you know, I turn up at these tournaments or I play, 
you know, I play these guys, and I, I, I don't know them. I can't open my black book and go, all right, last time I played, you know, Max Mirny, and I can't, I can't run the playbook on him, as it were. But what you can do, just to kind of throw it in and let me know what you think, but what you can do is by recording, um, and you don't have to write pages and pages, but you can just write a very, very brief match reports, kind of outlining who you played, Singles or doubles, you know, what kind of players were they, what you did well, and what you didn't do well, what you would do next time. You can actually, once you start playing a pair, even if you don't know them, but you can quickly identify, ah, oh, right, they're a left and a right pair, or they're, they're a pair that stay back a lot. Last time we played the last four pairs that did that, that worked, this didn't work. So it yeah. doesn't mean you don't have to know the pair specifically, but you can certainly match up game styles according to what you've done previously. That's it. And there's a lot of players out there that, you know, we know that you guys and girls won't have played before and may not have seen before. So you find a lot out of, about them as much as you can in the warm-up mm. uh, and in the first couple of games. You play your normal game and just try and keep an eye out for that little opening, that little weakness. And the, the key here, when I played... With uh, Look, I've been playing a few local uh, tournaments here in Australia just with some young kids trying to help them develop their double skills and you know try and have a little bit of success and a bit of fun. Uh, there's a lot of players who I've never seen before, uh, a lot younger now. So I'm hitting up with my partner or my, my opponent and uh, my partner's hitting up with their side of the opponent. And before the match starts, well, I come across and say, hey, how's this guy volley? You know, oh, yeah, it's not too bad. I said, look, this guy's got a really poor forehand volley. Uh, his overhead's not that great. Now, these are some things we can target in the match. That's only a warm-up, yes, but mm -hmm. I've taken that information in. These are things I'm looking for. I'm not so much uh, centred on myself and how I'm hitting my shots and what feels good for this and that. I'm looking more for what can I find out about my opponent, and that's basically what I use the warm-up for, and uh, and I think it's a good idea for, for a lot of us out there that they do the same, and that way you can get a bit of a feel for what's going on with uh, the people on the other side of the net. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that that's a really good tip, but um, you're right. Some people are so focused on what they're doing and getting themselves up to speed, which is fair enough, you know, but you can gain, and, and you're missing if you're not doing it, some really valuable information about the other, the other team.